It is Friday, March 24th. Let's talk PlayStation. Uh, kind of a slow news week, but we always find something to discuss. So, uh, first and foremost, the Gran Turismo Sport beta is actually starting pretty much right now. The closed beta in the U.S. is considered phase one for the closed beta. So, if you had previously signed up, you might want to keep your eye out in your emails or your PSN notifications to see if you got a code to be into the beta. Now, if you're in Europe... Um, you're getting ready for phase two. You can still sign up for it. So you still have a, you know, sort of a chance to get into this thing. Uh, but right now, if you did sign up previously in North America, uh, certainly check around to see if you did get access to the, uh, to the closed beta, which, you know, so the, the fact that the closed beta is starting for Gran Turismo Sport is good news. When any sort of beta happens, you kind of know that the game actually is getting closer to release, and that builds us some some relative confidence that the game's going to hit its release date, because that's always sort of a big fear nowadays, is that these big budget games don't hit the release dates, because they do that pretty often. Scrounging up this one and kind of bringing it up as news, because there's not really a whole lot going on, um, Uncharted, uh, The Lost Legacy, the DLC that's going to be coming up, the story standalone DLC, uh, we got confirmation from Naughty Dog that Nathan Drake is not going to be in the piece of DLC at all more or less. Well, the standalone game. I, it's easy to call it DLC. It's not DLC. Um, <clears throat> but he's not going to be in there whatsoever. If that, if you were at all sort of expecting a cameo appearance from, from Drake or anything like that, that's not going to be the case. Although not entirely surprising because the story isn't actually going to be focusing on Nathan Drake at all. But don't expect him to be in there when you get to play it soon. All right, but now some actual news. Uh, so just recently there was a report by the IHS market sort of discussing Overall console sales and everything for 2016 and how the games business, the video game industry, um, how it looked as a whole for the year of 2016. So uh, actually the console industry shrunk 2.5% in 2016, although Sony was the only co uh, company that actually had growth. Um, and positive numbers for Sony, more or less, uh, they were leading with 57% across hardware, games, content, and services for all of 2016. The console market amounted to $35 billion in 2016, Sony um, amounted to $17.8 billion of that, uh, bringing them to a 51% console market share. Their closest uh, competitor, of course, being Xbox One, came in with 26% market share at $9.1 billion. So just a couple of uh, nice little figures there for you. Unsurprisingly, whenever we, we usually talk about Sony numbers or financials or anything of the sort in regards to sales, more or less specifically PlayStation 4, of course, whenever we talk Vita, it's not necessarily all that great. But whenever it's PS4, it seems to, it seems to be doing very well. And I always kind of go back to like what we had mentioned previously, like back in 2013, far pre-release before we even really knew what Xbox One was going to be. And of course, the PR disaster that led to that, you know, sort of system's downfall, which certainly did heavily attribute to the fact that it's not doing nearly as well as it probably would have. And my initial, the one thing that I was totally wrong about was I, back then I was like, you know, Microsoft was super aggressive with 360 back in the day. They're not going to hold any, you know, guns back this generation either. Um, Sony was the underdog with PlayStation 3, so I had admittedly very low hope for Sony in regards to PlayStation 4, and I had a feeling that Microsoft was just going to kill it right off the bat with X1, and sure enough, that definitely was not the case whatsoever. But what's even more interesting now as the years pass by and this, this current generation sort of matures a little bit is that it's really not going anywhere in terms of some sort of interesting conflict. Do you know what I mean? Now, if, it, if you go back to something as early as Sega versus Nintendo, that was an interesting console war. Even more recently, 360 versus PS3 was an extremely interesting console war. Not only because Microsoft had a year lead, or that Sony um, had a tremendous fallout with the PS3's launch date, or Microsoft's um, incredible fallout with the Red Ring of Death and losing a lot of money there, um, the HD DVD versus Blu-ray war, um, you know, Microsoft releasing Kinect, Sony releasing PlayStation Move. I mean, it was an incredibly interesting war, and it was close, too, is the thing. You know, granted that Microsoft had that lead, and Sony slowly catching up and doing those price drops, but also removing a lot from the hardware to bring the, the cost down, and them still losing money on every single hardware sale. And, and like I said, in the meantime, Microsoft's recouping all this money from having poor hardware and having to repair a lot of 360s. That was an incredible war, but you look to it now, and the really only sort of meaningful battle that led up to PS4 and X1 was just the pre-release, because that was sort of the big thing, right? Before these systems even launched, and you'd had that situation in 2013 E3 where Sony took the stage to say, we're not doing any of that used game stuff and got, you know, a 
huge applause and like for some people a standing ovation um and microsoft kind of falling back but making great you know consumer friendly choices you, you know despite the fact that microsoft's doing a lot of great things like nothing's doing it for them and, and interestingly enough they're doing a lot of things that while they're super pro consumer like bringing all their games to pc it's business wise making xbox a little bit irrelevant which is kind of odd because you would figure that they want to sell as many x ones as they can and so a lot of their moves are certainly great for end consumers, but at the same time, it's also a little bit jarring. Um, but you see all these sort of things that are going on, and it's like kind of the same stuff every month, every quarter, every year. Sony's holding their lead, um, regardless of kind of what they do. So it's just, it's weird. We're in this place now where Sony's just killing it, right? Good for them. I'm sure they're very happy about that, but it's like... <laughs> it's, Funny enough, it's just not, it, you know, it's not like it was, where it was just like the constant internet wars and the actual proper debates and discussions that could be had between both manufacturers, because nowadays it is kind of one-sided. Um, yeah, not to say that's a bad thing or a good thing, I, I'm kind of indifferent, I guess, just, yeah, it's a little boring. <laughs> But there are still a number of interesting things that happen, and I think what you can really take away from this generation is that whether you were playing on Xbox One or PlayStation 4, you benefited, I think, a lot no matter what. And uh, certainly if you were also a PC gamer, you're benefiting a lot because of the, all the moves that Sony and Microsoft are doing. I think it's kind of a good place to, to really be into games right now. A lot of good things are going on. And uh, there is more... P that's, the, I guess, the definitely the best benefit here is that there's more peace... I use that term loosely. There's more peace in games now than there was 10, 20, 30 years ago. So for our last news story, I thought this would make an interesting talking point because uh, just recently on Twitter, um, the Nier Autonoma director, Yoko Taro, uh, was tweeting about how he'd love to see a PlayStation Vita 2 and more or less kind of jumping off that point of the recent release of Nintendo Switch and saying that while the system is quite large, it's kind of influenced the, the whole idea of like, you know, a PlayStation Vita 2 or another, you know, Sony handheld would actually be really awesome. Uh, kind of also he was detailing into how, you know, smart ga uh, smartphone games and all that, you know, don't really do it for him or whatever. And he still thinks that there's a place for another um, Sony handheld. And we touched on it a little bit when we talked about the recent patent that Sony made where, you know, that patent design looked more or less kind of like a Switch. The controllers looked somewhat detached or detachable or something. It didn't really say that. Um, uh, right in front of you but you know we kind of all had that idea and we always we, back then we talked about how interesting that was that if sony were to do a sequel to or do it you know a successor to the, to the vita or another dedicated sony handheld that they kind of came to the same idea that nintendo came to because clearly they, the patent was filed in 2015 they were they're not copying nintendo we didn't know what the nx or anything that, that nintendo's xr was going to be back in 2015 so um but i think it raises a good point because we didn't really touch on it too much about you know because we don't, we, it's, it's, it's sad because we don't really talk about Vita all that much anymore, and that's because there's not really a whole lot going on with Vita. Um, Sony ignores it, ignores it at trade shows more or less, and while they still manufacture, this is the, it's the thing I always tell you guys, you know I always say this, uh, Sony still manufactures the system, they still send out dev kits, they still help developers get on Vita, and developers that still make games on Vita are actually doing quite well because of the high attach rate for the system, and people actually can make games on there and, and sort of um, live comfortably on it more or less on that platform where their games are profitable and they can sustain themselves releasing uh, games on it, even though it's such a small install base, you can be guaranteed that with a small budget, you're going to be making your money back. Um, but the Vita is a, a great handheld, I think we can all say. It's it's awesome if you don't think so. I mean, it's, it's totally worth it. There's a lot of great games for it now, especially since it's, um, you know, how many years old now. But what we didn't really touch on is the fact that uh, the Switch, that's the jumping off point, right? The N Nintendo Switch. Because... What's interesting about the Switch, and I don't remember if I've talked about it, uh, I've always mentioned I love the concept of the hardware. I think this is Nintendo bridging the gap between their handheld and their consoles. They've realized that their console market, for them, mind you, just for them, because this is something that Sony certainly doesn't have a problem with. Microsoft is still you know, staying alive in that sort of realm, but Nintendo has been on a downward spiral with hardware uh, for a very long time. The Wii was the only outlier where they sold a, butt a buttload of those, and that's just because they kind of had that jumping off point of their, you know, the, the, the waggle and all that, you know, gimmicky nonsense. The, game, the platform had no third-party support whatsoever, and um, they did well on the hardware front just by getting people to buy the initial, you know, the in initial Wii, and then one or two games after that for most, uh, for most families and most consumers. But for the most part, Nintendo hardware has been on a decline. But in the meantime, you can look at handhelds for Nintendo, 
and sure enough they are still living very comfortably in that sort of landscape. Uh, now they're at what 55, 60 million something 3DS's. That's nothing to scoff at. It's not DS numbers by any stretch of the imagination. DS is well over uh, close to 150 million I think a little bit over but that's a lot of DS's. Now 60 million is not that Nowhere near that, but 60 million is a number you can live off of. You can be in that landscape, you can release lots of quality games for it, which is what the 3DS has, is a very great library. And so Nintendo's kind of realizing this is the sort of situation where they might turn into, right? There may not be another DS sort of handheld that is smaller and dedicated. This may just be Nintendo's one piece of hardware moving forward. We got another indication of that earlier this week when... Um, Game Freak, the developer of all the Pokemon games, is looking for developers that have um, experience in developing Wii U and PS Vita-like games. Which tells you, Game Freak, they only make Pokemon games, they only make handheld Pokemon games. That might finally be a situation where we get a Pokemon game on a sort of Nintendo console. But I use that loosely because the Switch is kind of a hybrid of the two, right? So I think what's very important to look at here is that I think Sony is going to be watching the Switch and see how well the Switch does because I think that might dictate... Sony's next move on possibly releasing another handheld. They've already now Sony's already commented a number of times about how the um, the industry and the market just isn't what it used to be. Um, Jack Trenton, who when he used to be at Sony, recently had mentioned how um, internally at Sony they loved the Vita, they thought it was great, but they just kind of knew deep down like this is just, it just the market's different. Like people just don't buy this type of hardware anymore. And the you know they're seeing initial sales, they're seeing it's not going all that well, and they believe in the hardware, but like they just know that it's just not what it used to be. But the Switch might be a situation where, and I'm not gonna sit sit here and tell you that the Switch is going to do gangbusters and it's going to sell you know as much as say PlayStation 4 or something absurd like DS or something. It's not gonna do. I don't think it's gonna do amazing. Uh, quite honestly, I'll tell you my initial gut about the Switch is that it is, it is definitely without a doubt going to do better than the Wii U. I think for sure. Um, the Wii U just was bad, really bad. I haven't checked the last time Wii U had, I didn't, had, I haven't checked the Wii U's numbers in a while, but I know for a fact PS Vita sold more than the Wii U, um, which I'll tell you, it wasn't all that great. I think the Switch is definitely going to be, I, th I honestly, my gut reaction is I think the Switch will do better than GameCube. Now GameCube topped off at about 24 million units. Um, I could see the Switch easily doing over 30. I don't think it would get well over 50. I think 50 would be fantastic for them in the lifetime of the Switch. But I know, I for some reason, I really think it is going to at least go past GameCube numbers and go back to GameCube. Those were numbers that Nintendo was using and working with and staying in the industry. 30 million is something they can they can work with. And if Sony were to look at 30 million Switches being sold, they could probably justify, hey, we might you know be in a situation where we could do another handheld, but we can do it in a way where it makes sense because that's what I think is great about the Switch. It makes a lot of sense. Now, I, my buddy had just recently finally got a Switch. He actually went off uh, eBay and paid a surplus for it. He had a pre-order and then he got rid of it like an idiot. And then he wanted one once it came out. So, But he did that, right? And I, so I finally got a, over to go and you know mess around with his. That thing's awesome. Now, if you don't like Nintendo or whatever, you don't care about Zelda, that's fine. You know, That's your prerogative. But the, the hardware is awesome. It is totally cool. It works. And, you know, that's, I think, what's most exciting. If you're somebody that likes PlayStation Vita, right, then there's no reason to not sort of like what the Switch is doing. Because it was, you might think it's a novelty, you might think it's it's really dumb, but it was it was just so cool, right? I walked in, he's sitting there playing it on his TV. He's like, here, sit down, go go right ahead. So I'm like, I don't, I don't even want to play on this. I've seen this. I've seen console gaming. I want to do with the, the whole point of the Switch. So I took the Joy-Cons out of the... um. You know, the, the mid-center controller, snapped them in, pulled the whole thing off. It was awesome, right? You're playing Zelda right there on this beautiful screen. And if, like I said, if you're a Vita owner, if you love PlayStation Vita, the Switch is just like, that's kind of what the Switch feels like. A successor to Vita. Just Nintendo. Uh, so I, that's what I'm thinking, you know? I mean, this, if the Switch can do a reasonable amount, I think that can prove that the, the, there, there is a place for it, you know? And Nintendo sort of found that way. That's why they kind of did the Switch. I think that's why they took their sort of unique route. Granted, they're Nintendo and they always take a sort of unique approach to games. They're not, they've never never been about power or, you know, numbers, frame rate, resolution, um, pushing graphics. And they've never been about that. They've been about changing the sort of idea of how we play games and different input methods and things like that. So the Switch is no surprise at all, but I think that was, you know, twofold. Nintendo being Nintendo and Nintendo trying to figure out where they can have their place in games again. The Switch is a great idea. Um, 
I still don't think it would be, I, I still don't think it'll sell amazing by any stretch, but I think it will find a place. And if Sony were to be able to see that, I think they can sort of see that another PlayStation handheld isn't out of the realms of impossibility as long as they sort of take a page out of Nintendo's book and kind of make a, a successor to PlayStation Vita something that keeps it relevant. Those are some of the news stories I want to talk about with you guys this week. Uh, funny enough, this is, uh, let's talk PlayStation 249, 249 episodes, so next week is 250, which is nuts. I've been doing Let's Talk PlayStation for four, almost five years now or something. I don't even know at this point. That's a lot of episodes. Although I will let you know right now, 250 ain't gonna be nothing special. I try to do fancy editing for, like, I did fancy editing for 100 and 200, but I, I think the 50s I never did anything super significant for, so don't expect anything special for 250. But i just like to mention, hey, 250. That's a lot of fucking Fridays I've been doing this damn thing. And I'm so glad you've all been here every single Friday to talk to me and talk to each other. We're all just such a big family. Come here, you son of a bitch. That yeah, concludes this week's episode of Let's Talk PlayStation. I'm Ryan Benek. Thank you all so much for talking with me, and I'll see you all next Friday.